U.S. Naval War College is a Navy's home of thought. Established in 1884, NWC has become the center of naval sea power, both strategically and intellectually. The following Issues in National Security Lecture is specifically designed to offer scholarly lectures to all participants. We hope you enjoy this upcoming discussion and future lectures. Well, good afternoon, and welcome to the fourth Issues in National Security Lecture for Academic Year 2021-22. I am Commander Gary Ross, and I'll serve as your host for today's event. Professor John Jackson is on a well-deserved vacation, and I'm looking forward to hosting you today. To kick us off, uh, I'd like to turn it over, um, as normal, to uh, Rear Admiral Shoshana Chatfield, President of the Naval War College, so she can offer her greetings. Admiral? Okay, so I'd like to welcome our audience in person and those who have joined online. Uh, we are uh, maintaining our hybrid approach to this lecture series uh, because we know that uh, there are still many uh, factors that people are considering when they schedule their time right now uh, based on their needs of family and uh, their requirements uh, for pertaining to COVID. Uh, so thank you for coming in person and thank you for coming online. Um, I'm really looking forward to the lecture tonight. I'm joined here by my husband, uh, David Scoville, uh, who uh, has been such a, a good part of um, making these lectures even more relevant by working with our benefits partners uh, to support our, uh, our family discussion group after. Uh, so I'll turn it back over to Gary. And uh, there, again, thank you for coming. And I'd just like to say uh, welcome to our 64 participants on Zoom. Uh, thank you very much, Admiral. Uh, for anyone just joining us, I, I want to reiterate that this uh, series originally was conceived as a way to share a portion of the Naval War College's academic experience with the spouses and significant others of our student body. Over the past four years, it has been restructured to include participation by the entire Naval War College extended family to include members of the Naval War College Foundation, international sponsors, civilian employees, and colleagues throughout Naval Station Newport. We will be offering 11 additional lectures to, between now and May 2022, spaced about two weeks apart on a wide variety of national security topics and issues. An announcement detailing the dates, topics, and speakers of each lecture will be sent by me, both on email and posted on our website. A special note, and because of the upcoming Thanksgiving Day holiday, um, our next lecture will be on Monday, 22 November. We will be featuring an engaging discussion on China and zombies with Professor Jim Holmes. China continues to be um, quite a bit in the news lately. Each lecture event consists of three parts, the scholarly speaker's presentation, a question and answer period, and then a family discussion group session. This final segment is a, a primary interest to family members residing here in Newport, and it will feature guest speakers from various support activities and organizations here locally or on base. The family discussion group special guest for this week is Eugene Genero to discuss Humana Healthcare's open enrollment and uh, TRICARE benefits. Okay, on with the main event. Please feel free to ask questions using the chat feature in Zoom, and we will address them at the conclusion of the presentation. I am very pleased to introduce our speaker, Professor David Burbach. Professor Burbach will survey how space has factored into US national security from Sputnik to the emerging era of great power competition. Space was an important front of the Cold War, from beyond top secret spy satellites to 1 billion people watching Americans land on the moon. In recent decades, space-based services like GPS, communications, or high resolution weather forecasting have become a part of our daily lives as well as a critical enabler, enabler of military operations. The benefits provided by our space systems represent potential vulnerabilities in times of conflict um, though, and competitors like Russia and China have significant counter space capabilities. The presentation will describe potential threats 
and policy responses facing American space power today. Finally, he will discuss future possibilities, challenges, and misperceptions around the new U.S. Space Force. Professor Burbach teaches the politics of U.S. foreign policy, space security, and international relations. His scholarly interests include civil-military relations, defense planning, and the relationship between international security and technology, particularly space and nuclear policy. Before joining the Naval War College faculty in 2007, he taught at the Army School of Advanced Military Studies and also worked for several policy analysis and information technology organizations. I am pleased to pass the microphone over to Professor Burbach. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'd like to thank those of you here in the hall for joining us in person today everybody on Zoom for uh, joining us from the comfort of your homes or wherever you may be this afternoon. And I'd also like to send a message to the future. And those of you who may be members of the public watching us on YouTube after the lecture, thank you for your interest in what the Naval War College has to offer. Today, I'd like to spend some time talking to you about space and how it relates to US national security. Space, as you all know, is big. And the topic of space is very big. So I won't be able to cover everything that could possibly relate. But what I will try to do is to give you a brief introduction to how space mattered to us during the Cold War, what has changed and how we're thinking about space differently now in this era of great power competition, some of the particular challenges and possible policy responses, um, and thinking outside space in a purely military context, I'm um, thinking about some of the new developments, whether it's NASA going back to the moon or the rise of commercial spaceflight. Uh, and I look forward to uh, taking questions from those of you here in person and those of you on Zoom at the end. Those of you in the future, I apologize, but I haven't yet figured out how to make the questions come back in time to today, but hopefully it'll still be of, of interest to you. Um, so we often talk about space as a new challenge, you know, as something we need to pay more attention to as, you know, one of the, you know, new cutting edge things. But in a sense, space really isn't all that new. Uh, Sputnik was launched in 1957. Um, satellites are almost as old as helicopters or ballpoint pens. Um, we've been operating in space for a very long time. Um, you know, before, you know, uh, be you know, before almost anybody serving in today's military was born. Uh, in most cases, at least, you know, the, certainly our war college students. Um, so what's actually new? And like I said, I'll, I'll before answering that question, I'll try to give you a bit of a sense of how space mattered in previous decades. And you're probably familiar with the space race leading up to the moon landing eventually. And in the early days, um, one of the, the aspects of space in American policy was space for national prestige. Um, and this was a very, very conscious thing, you know, trying to put astronauts in space to orbit the Earth, you know, to be the first in orbit or, you know, the first to have two people in orbit or the first spacewalk. Um, this was something we saw, you know, not just, you know, wow, the world happened to pay attention. We very consciously understood that we were trying to prove that we represented the future, that America had the best technology, had the best system. And if the, uh, uh, I haven't been able to find a better photocopy, but you may see in the uh, newspaper, the editorial cartoon in the upper right, um, Soviet leader Sergei Khrushchev holding the hand of lesser nations, you know, I like a better term, but you know, meant to be the developing world, you know, Uncle Sam with just a bouquet of roses and Khrushchev saying, who else can give you a moon? That cartoon is why we went to the moon. I mean, not literally that one cartoon, but we went to the moon to prove to the world that we could do it, that we could do it before the Soviets, and to show that if you were you know, a newly decolonized country in Africa or Asia, deciding who to align with, how to vote at the UN, that the future was gonna be with America and not with the Soviets. And again, we very consciously made use of this. The uh, photo uh, that I'm standing in front of, perhaps from your angle, uh, shows after John Glenn's flight around the world, we actually sent his space capsule on another trip around the world, you know, by airplane and truck, showing it off in cities all over the world with people queuing up to see this, you know, this uh, marvelous display. 
And, you know, of course, this really reached its fruition when we landed on the moon in 1969 and accomplished that mission that John Kennedy set out. One in every six human beings watched it on television live. And of course, television was much newer then. You know, this was still, you know, that was a pretty amazing audience for the time. And again, something that we consciously made use of our diplomatic and information elements of national power. We actually reached out and uh, the United States helped fund the uh, construction of TV networks in some developing countries. You know, we, we actively worked to make it possible for people all over the world to see this. Um, you know, the photo here is just one representative example, a department store in Australia where people showed up in a crowd at 6 a.m. to watch the landing live because most people didn't have sets at home then, uh, you know, at least in Australia. So we, you know, we very consciously used this, you know, manned space program, human space program to show the world, you know, what our system could do. But at the same time, there was another aspect to space that was much quieter. We didn't talk about very much, but that was, as far as U.S. national security officials were concerned, was just as important. And that was using space to spy on our enemies. Um, we wanted, to, we needed to use space to figure out what the Soviets and their allies were up to. And let me take a second, you know, just because hey, it, it's almost hard to imagine not knowing what's going on everywhere. You know, the photo I have up here is it just. You know, the first, uh, you know, Bing, I think it was from Bing as opposed to Google Maps, image of the Chinese Ministry of Defense complex in Beijing taken by a commercial satellite. You can pull up that kind of stuff easily. If any adversary wants, you know, to get a close up view of the Naval War College and get our, the exact GPS coordinates of Spruance Hall, that's now a trivial thing to do. If they're curious enough, in fact, to know, were people in the parking lot today, you can now get commercial imaging, you know, that is, you know, refreshed every few hours, you know, and see is the Naval War College parking lot full or not. But that's not what we had as an adversary in the 1950s. Um, the Soviet Union was an extremely closed society. They didn't publish good maps. They certainly didn't publish good data. We in the 1950s, in some cases, were having to rely on captured maps from the Germans that they had made when they invaded the Soviet Union in the 1940s, um, because we didn't have any better. So we didn't know how many nuclear weapons do they have? Where are they based? You know, what's the size of their nuclear program? Are they getting their nuclear missiles or nuclear bombers or you know, eventually missiles? Are they getting them ready to launch? We didn't know. And we tried, you know, we tried what we could get from human spies. We tried launching balloons over the Soviet Union with cameras just randomly taking pictures. That, in fact, if any of you have heard of the Roswell, New Mexico UFO in 1947, it was actually, you know, what actually happened is one of the balloons we were testing for that program crashed. And, you know, the various missed stories, you know, uh, you know misinformation got out about that. We flew U-2 airplanes over the Soviet Union. Uh, you know, eventually one got shot down in 1960. But what we really understood as far back as, as the 1940s was that the thing to do was going to be to look at our adversaries from space. And within two years of Sputnik, the first American spy satellite was in orbit, sending film capsules back down with images of uh, Soviet military facilities. Uh, the photo that you see here uh, on the lower right is a much is is a much newer 1980s photo from a more advanced satellite. Um, but this was revolutionary. It allowed American leaders to know what's the so what do they actually have? What are their capabilities? You know, technically, how much do they have, and what's their current state of readiness? And Lyndon John President Lyndon Johnson. I, I love this because he says right at the beginning of the quote, I don't want to be quoted on this. And then it was in the New York Times immediately afterwards. Uh, but Johnson said, I know how many missiles they have. You know, I don't have to worry about, you know, are they secretly building a new missile force that I don't know about? Or are they getting their missiles ready for war? Um, you know, they can't sneak that by us. And as Johnson explained, that's good because we don't have to then spend money on defense just in case. We don't have to be at a state of readiness to possibly, you know, scare each other into going to war because we know what the current Soviet military posture is like because of our satellites. As Johnson said here, 
you know, it'd be worth doing going to the moon 10 times over just to have these spy photographs. Um, at the time, this, you know, when this went out, this was a, you know, we didn't talk much about this program. This is a pretty, you know, um, strong statement. You know, we, we didn't talk much about these capabilities. I think it's now we all sort of understand this, but it's important to understand in the Cold War that, you know, on the military side, this was, this was the crown jewels of American intelligence, being able to see what the other side was doing. We also pretty quickly developed other military applications um, within, you know, by the mid-1960s, the Navy had a very early predecessor of GPS. Uh, you know, I don't know exactly how it worked, but I think, you know, there were some, some technicians doing a bunch of calculations as opposed to, you know, it just showing, your, showing you a nice dot on a map, but we pretty quickly were using navigational uses, weather satellites, communication satellites, and also critically, uh, missile warning, so that we would know if the Soviets launched their missiles at us, so that we would have some warning time. And the Soviets also, you know, running behind the U.S. technically, but they too realized, they too made use of these technologies. Um, and uh, let's see, I, there, okay, there's where I want to be. One thing they didn't do, however, is, you know, when we talk about space and that, you know, one of the one thing that people often wonder about is what about weapons in space, you know, attacking Earth from space? We actually in the Cold War didn't really do this. And both sides realized pretty quickly um, that putting nuclear bombs in orbit ready to call down to attack Earth was probably not a very good idea. Because like, what if the other side launched some astronauts to go, you know, pull the wires out of your orbiting nuclear bomb? You know, that would kind of suck. Or what if something went wrong, you know, and it crashed during launch? Um, so we realized with missiles and bombers, who needs to put nuclear weapons orbiting continuously in space? There's also theoretically, you could have objects come down like meteors and you know, strike targets on Earth. But it, certainly with the technology of the Cold War, and even today, that's a really difficult problem. I mean, we, we're starting to make progress with current hypersonic technology, but the notion that you basically have a big chunk of steel or tungsten or something come down, slam into tanks on Earth, that's a really hard thing to do. So we, we didn't really do that either. What both sides looked into in the Cold War, though, was how do you attack targets in space? And we did figure out pretty quickly that nuclear weapons are actually, surprisingly, nuclear weapons are actually good at blowing up satellites. They're good at blowing up anything nearby. Um, unfortunately, they're too good. We learned that the radiation from the bombs gets trapped in belts around the Earth and will knock other satellites out of commission. The test that you see on the left, a uh, nuclear test uh, that's from Honolulu looking out over the South Pacific, that American nuclear test destroyed the first AT&T television relay satellite. Um, days later from some of the trapped radiation, knocked out several of our military satellites. So we realized, you know, if you really have to in a war, maybe, but, but boy, a few nuclear explosions can render space unusable, as well as creating radiation that would kill astronauts. We also, uh, both sides tried, and, and, you know, the Soviets especially, some non-nuclear systems where like a satellite would get near another satellite, explode into fragments, um, a little clumsy, and it would create a lot of debris. If any of you have seen the, the movie Gravity, uh, you know, the, this Kessler syndrome idea where fragments from one satellite destroy another satellite, and, you know, pretty quickly space becomes a very difficult environment for everyone. So the bottom line in the Cold War was both sides actually ended up fairly restrained. You know, for all that in the very first few years of space, there were all, like, the Air Force proposed setting off a big nuclear bomb on the moon just to show we could do it. Um, you know, they propose, I go Air Force. Uh, you know, the, you know, there were proposals that we put battle stations in orbit that we needed, you know, to have, you know, moon troops stationed on the moon to, you know, the, the two never really got filled out very well, but pretty quickly both sides kind of settled on this relatively restrained role where we understood space was important for nuclear early warning and understood that if you take out the other side's nuclear early warning, they might be afraid that you're about to launch and start a nuclear war. So there was a certain stabilizing value. Um, we even signed something that's today called kind of the foundational document of space law, the Outer Space Treaty, where we and the Soviets and almost ever, every other country on Earth agreed to not place nuclear weapons in orbit. We also said that space is to be used for peaceful purposes, and that clause doesn't really get 
you know, developed out very much. And so we've kind of interpreted it to mean as long as you're not actually shooting at somebody, you're good, you know, but it at least says, let's try and keep space peaceful. So it's, it's, you know, the term can be a little overused, but I'll go ahead and use it. And the Cold War space was relatively a sanctuary where, you know, both sides had important um, surveillance assets, but we didn't do a lot. We certainly didn't shoot at each other and we really kind of left space a little bit alone. Well, so what's different now? Why are we thinking of space differently? Why do we see new challenges? And the basic issue is that space is now in absolutely everything, civilian and military. Um, the navigational systems of the 1960s were, you know, big boxes of electronics on submarines or aircraft carriers. Today, we all have GPS in our cell phones. You might have GPS in a watch. We, in addition to the satellite signals being used for navigation, um, they're important for timing. You know, the cell phone network and the internet don't work without the nanosecond precision signals from space from our GPS satellites. Um, of course, we use it for communications on both the civilian and military side. Um, you know, the, uh, there's a very, the, you know, very typical Pentagon style chart here in the lower left of imagining, you know, networks of satellite sensors and communications. You know, for military operations or daily life, space is, is now critical. It's no longer kind of this special thing like, you know, that, that only really mattered for strategic nuclear systems. Um, and, you know, as I said, from in the 1991 Persian Gulf War, uh, we sometimes refer to that as the first space war where you first saw GPS being used widely. We didn't actually yet have GPS guided bombs, but it was being used by the air, uh, aircraft using uh, missile warning satellites for tactical warning of short range missiles, not only scanning for Soviet ICBMs. And since then, it's exploded where, you know, we have been using, you know, communications uh, surveillance satellites to intercept terrorist cell phone calls in Afghanistan. Um, I mean, at least, you know, we, we all assume we do that. Um, you know, we have, you know, tremendous capability that even for kind of low level operations, you know, anti-terrorism operations, space is fundamentally a part of that. So our military today uses space for just about everything. Um, well, when you combine that with the return to great power competition, well, you know, that makes things a little bit different in space because uh, we've been dealing mostly with adversaries who have no capability to take away our space capability. The Taliban certainly did not. Iran and North Korea may have some very rudimentary capabilities, but not very much. Um, so we were able to exploit our space capabilities without really having to worry very much about what might be done against those capabilities. That would be very different against Russia or China. They're both capable militaries that have their own space assets that support their military operations. And very importantly, they both have counter space capabilities. They both have capabilities to destroy or interfere with other nations' use of space. And if you imagine that we're in a conflict with Russia or China, we then would have to worry, would they see a value in taking away degrading American space capabilities? And it seems like they probably would. I mean, not just in a sense of, well, you know, you want to do anything you can to help the adversary, but there's probably an asymmetry where we are more vulnerable to that threat than the, our likely adversaries in China or Russia, partly because we, you know, although they are capable and technologically advanced militaries, they aren't as space reliant, as technologically dependent, as capital intense as the U.S. military. Um, but a lot of it is also geography. You, on the, uh, the graphic on the right here shows in red, you know, the length of uh, you know, the lines of communication from Beijing or Hailan Island to the South China Sea, green from the United States. We're likely, if we're in a conflict involving Taiwan or the South China Sea, the U.S. military is probably operating almost halfway around the globe from the United States, thousands of miles away from any land bases. The Chinese military is going to be very close to home. They can use fiber optic lines from Beijing to bases on the coast, and then it's relatively short aircraft range, you know, out to where, uh, you know, they, they might need to be. So, you know, the sheer ge geographic factor means we have to use space. Now, if, you know, hopefully it doesn't go this way, if the Chinese Navy were to try to attack San Diego, 
you know, it'd be flipped. We'd be in a position of, of being able to operate very close to shore, and the Chinese would be dependent on space to commu communications to operate halfway around the globe. But, you know, that seems a less likely scenario. Um, so we have to worry that if we get into a conflict with China, you know, China's going to know that the U.S. military makes very heavy use of space assets to do almost anything, that we don't have easy fallbacks when operating that far away from home across a big ocean. So it makes sense that they might be interested in uh, challenging or attacking U.S. space capabilities. And there are a few ways they might do that. Um, Technology for attacking satellites kinetically has gotten better. You no longer have to use a nuclear weapon to be sure. Uh, we and other countries have, are good enough at intercept now that the U.S., Russia, China, and India have all tested kinetic intercept weapons that destroy satellites. Now, this is still the problem of space debris is still there. Uh, in fact, the Chinese and the Indians created a bunch of debris with their tests within the last decade. Uh, the U.S., uh, we, we did a recent test uh, with a satellite that fortunately was so low in its orbit, it was just about to reenter that most of that debris did not stay in orbit very long. Um, but if we were to have a shooting war, it wouldn't take very many attacks on satellites to create a lot of space debris that not only would affect our military satellites, but commercial satellites of every country in the world. So this is a, this is a big concern, you know, not just for national security people, but anyone in the world who uses space. Um, there might also be some new technologies that would allow physical destruction of a satellite without creating so much debris. Uh, you know, if you, uh, you know, can see in my graphic on the right, you know, a little satellite grabbing onto uh, a big satellite. Um, if you have the technology to rendezvous with satellites and have a grappling arm that can stick out to repair or refuel your satellite, you also have the technology to close with an adversary satellite and stick out a grappling arm with like a pair of wire cutters or a can of spray paint um, and disable their satellite. Um, this is why we, in fact, you know, uh, I think a few over over enthused analysts on the U.S. side said the new Chinese space station has an anti-satellite capability because it has a robot arm kind of like the Canadian arm on our space station. Well, that's true. You probably wouldn't maneuver your whole giant obvious space station to try and, you know, we would see it coming. It wouldn't be a very smart way to do it. But if you have the technology to rendezvous and, and interact with the satellite to repair it, you might also be able to destroy it. So, you know, there are some new technologies we're thinking of. There's probably even more attention now on what can you do to a satellite that's non-kinetic, that doesn't create that debris problem. Um, and we in the U.S., you, we now acknowledge that we have at least one actual jamming system, uh, you know, the big uh, antenna dish you see there, Space Force owns, to uh, overwhelm and jam uh, communication satellites. Um, the, we, we claim that the Chinese have tried firing lasers at U.S. In, uh, reconnaissance satellites passing over China to temporarily blind their sensors. Um, and one has to assume, you know, Russia has systems that also look like they are satellite blinding lasers. And one has to assume that country, you know, a variety of countries are working on electronic systems that, you know, whether through optic, you know, laser, uh, lasers damaging sensors, um, jamming, or cyber, it's even harder to know what the state of the art is because obviously no nation talks about, we found a bug in the adversary satellite software and here's what we can do to them. Now, nobody really knows. There have been a few cases of civilian satellites being hacked and you know, some you know, random hacking group taking control of them briefly. One has to assume that any of the major space powers is very interested in knowing how to do cyber attacks against adversary satellites. And one of the things that kind of makes this challenging is it's a, you know, it, it's, it may not be very obvious. I mean, this is very much an espionage kind of game where if your satellite stops working, is it because a cosmic ray just damaged the CPU or is it because an adversary cyber attack caused the computer to crash? There's no easy way to tell. You know, and finally, um, if you can't deal with the satellites, maybe you can deal with uh, with the ground stations. Uh, on the left is the uh, Space Force uh, communication station just outside of Manchester, New Hampshire, um, where, you know, if uh, you know, something bad were to happen to it, a couple of cruise missiles, you know, kind of come in from 
coast, fly over Manchester, blow up those radar domes. Well, we're not talking to the satellites anymore. China and Russia have, of course, their own equivalents as ground stations, including outside of their territory. I mean, we have ground stations all over the world. China has been actively expanding its network. This is a, uh, on the right-hand side, you see a Chinese uh, ribbon cutting for a Chinese ground station in Sweden to communicate with their civilian satellites and their uh, uh, human space flight program. But the Chinese too, for example, they now have a station in Namibia in Africa. So, you know, one possibility that might come up if there's a conflict is, are ground stations going to potentially be under attack? And this, you know, an interesting question this raises is, is an attack on a satellite justification to attack a ground station that belongs to the other side where you might actually kill people as opposed to merely attacking the machine in orbit? That's one of the, you know, law of war proportionality would say yes, um, but there, you know, Representative Jim Cooper, one of the uh, key sponsors of Space Force, has said, hey, no president's going to want to kill people just because somebody blew up one of our satellites. You know, and he says Space Force needs to figure out, you know, that this would be a bad idea for Space Force to say we'll deter attacks on satellites by threatening to blow up ground stations uh, of other countries. You know, it's, it's, it's an interesting legal, political and ethical problem. So given these new threats, what might the U.S. do? And there are a couple of directions that our policy might go in, and, and some of these could be pursued simultaneously. Um, one is we could try to make ourselves less vulnerable to attack. Um, and one of the, the kind of popular ideas there is rather than having a small number of exquisite, expensive, Battlestar Galactica satellites that do everything, maybe we need hundreds or thousands of cheap satellites. Um, if you have a thousand satellites that can kind of easily communicate and work as a network um, to do your communications instead of a few giant satellites, well, that's a much more difficult problem for an adversary that has to target them. You might also make satellites uh, less fragile. You could even put short range defensive technologies on a satellite, perhaps, where it might see an interceptor coming at it and fire its own short range defensive weapon against the interceptor. Um, but there's a lot of thought going into the technologies of, you know, what, what's the right answer here? How do we change? Um, we could also use deterrence. And, you know, my example of threatening ground stations of other side, of another side, um, we could, de we could declare that we see space is so important. We really object to escalation into the space domain. So we could, as a matter of declaratory policy, um, say, hey, certain, you know, cert all satellites or certain satellites are off limits. If you attack them, we'll go very hard after your space assets, after your ground stations that service those space assets, or after something else entirely. Um, now, the problem, of course, is if another country shoot, decides to call that bluff, you know, that we, we, you know, we may or may not like those consequences. Um, but there are certainly many analysts who say that the problem of defending satellites, which are fragile and move in predictable orbits, that that problem is so difficult, probably the only way to solve it is through deterrence as opposed to resilience and deterrence by denial. Um, you know, another thought, and this, this is looking harder and harder at this point in the game, um, is simply, you know, we, we get out front and make space, you know, and make sure that the U.S. has total space supremacy, the way that we seek air supremacy in a conflict. Make sure that nobody has the ability to harm our space assets. Um, that would be really ambitious. Because um, any country that has a civilian commercial space capability really has a military space capability too. Um, literally the same rocket that launches people in orbit for SpaceX launches US military satellites. Um, a lot of the underlying technology is very, very similar. So to me, at least it seems hard, you know, if you really wanted space supremacy, that's a very hard thing to do unless you essentially deny every other country in the world a space capability at all, or at least you're prepared to do that. That's a pretty big step. It'd be a very expensive step. Do we blow up launch facilities in other countries preemptively? Um, so we can certainly you know, do more offensively, but it's a, you know, that it's a race that looks pretty difficult. Finally, maybe we engage in diplomacy. You know, in the Cold War, there were a number of cases, as with the Outer Space Treaty, where we just we and the Soviets agreed that some technologies or some types of weapons 
were going to be so destabilizing that we both agreed in advance to stay away from them. Like we did actually, you know, we didn't have a formal treaty, but there was pretty much an understanding we're going to leave each other's miss nuclear missile warning satellites alone. Like we understand that if we blow up your missile warning satellite, you're probably going to assume we're about to launch a first strike. So we'll, we'll both kind of stay away from those. Um, or there could be opportunities for formal arms control agreements. You know, we, we, you know, might agree to, you know, not develop certain types of kinetic anti-space capabilities because of the debris problems that they could create. Um, you know, we might, you know, come to some sort of informal agreements about, you know, what, what to target or not to target. Um, but there are certainly many advocates for some sort of additional space arms control. There are people who say, hey, the Outer Space Treaty said space is supposed to be peaceful, so should there be any weapons in space? You know, we'll, you know, again, some possibilities to explore there. It seems difficult at the moment because, you know, for Russia or for China, they recognize that if you take space off the table, that's a net advantage for the United States in a conflict. So the problem is what's in it for them. Um, so not an, e not an easy situation for our diplomats. Um, well, finally, to kind of move off of the, the theory here and talk a little bit about some responses we're actually doing, um, one thing that we have done is we actually created a new service. You know, first time since 1947 and, you know, before that, going to the colonial era, we decided that the challenges that have come up are so severe and require such focused attention that at the end of 2019, C Congress approved and then President Trump signed into law the creation of Space Force as a separate service. I was fortunate enough to have the uh, Naval War College's very first Space Force student in my seminar this term. Uh, you know, if you're, John, if you're watching, good luck. Um, and I'm sure we will be seeing more as time goes on. So this was kind of a big deal. It seemed pretty interesting. What does Space Force actually do? Um, that's, you know, a lot of people seem to have the, you know, like, so this is going to be like Space Force has astronauts and, you know, they, they go somewhere and they shoot someone, people, bugs, Klingons, I don't know, uh, or, you know, space. And you can even find people who support space. You know, I could point you to an article on, I think it was a War on the Rocks blog piece, essentially saying, yeah, Space Force needs like, you know, space battleships like this. You know, we need to be able to maneuver, you know, with kind of the technology of how you do that left a little on, on we'll, we'll fill in that blank later. Um, if it seems like I'm a bit of a skeptic that Space Force is going to be doing Star Trek or Star Wars stuff anytime soon. I think physics just requires that. So Space Force is not going to be about, you know, human crewed battleships. It's definitely not going to be about space infantry. What Space Force is going to be about, uh, and if the, I'll, I'll uh, at least read the, the, the uh, text might be a little bit small for some of you, but the three key missions are space domain awareness, just knowing what's going on out there, um, which is not an easy problem. Satellites are, you know, small objects. If a country launches a satellite and doesn't tell us where it's going to be, you know, they do take a few steps to make it less reflective. So, to, you know, it's not as bright. Um, it can be very hard to know where things are. So, you know, kind of the first step is improve our ability to know what's happening uh, in orbit around the Earth, um, you know, even out as far as the moon. Space Force is not looking at Mars, Jupiter, Saturn. I mean, that we're still a ways from the rest of the solar system mattering. So they're really focused on the Earth to the moon to operate and defend U.S. space systems, U.S. satellites, U.S. launch systems. Um, you know, day-to-day -day operation is a lot of what they're doing, keeping your, you know, if, if you didn't realize it, GPS is a U.S. military system owned and operated by the, originally by the U.S. Air Force, now by U.S. Space Force. Uh, if Space Force doesn't keep, you know, GPS running, the whole world will quickly know and suffer and the mission of defending those satellites. Now, whether that means, you know, literally, you know, like intercepting an interceptor or through coming up with deterrent strategies, Space Force in cooperation with Space Command, the four-star geographic command that was also uh, created or I guess recreated, we used to have one back in the 1980s, and possibly engage in offensive counter space operations. Um, you know, we, the U.S. does not claim to have 
any offensive space weapons other than you know jamming, not to have any that actually destroy adversary satellites. Now, if you have anti-ballistic missile technology, you've I mean, what we used to shoot down a satellite in a test about 15 years ago uh, was actually a standard, you know, an, an ABM standard missile off of a Navy cruiser. Um, you know, if you can shoot down a ballistic missile warhead, you can probably shoot down a satellite. So we can have that technology if we wanted to. Um, but in the near term, this is all stuff that we were already doing. You know, my example of GP, you know, GPS did not come into existence the day Space Force was created. GPS has been around for years. So day to day, Space Force is mostly doing what the U.S. military already did in space, just now reorganized into a new service that focuses on space. Um, you know, longer term space, you know, one of the reasons for creating it, Bureau, if those of you who uh, you know, have been through uh, the TSDM or NSDM courses have talked a lot about bureaucratic politics. And one of the reasons that, you know, we created a separate service was to have a bureaucratic organization that would focus on space um, and develop a space aware culture, a, you know, really know the space domain. So eventually they probably are likely to, to think more about offensive space operations. Um, we do also know, I think General Raymond, uh, who has spoken here at the War College a couple of times, has made this clear, that right now space is almost ridiculously overclassified. There are probably things you learned in a high school physics course that if somebody in the U.S. space community had to put them in front of you, they'd have to put a secret no foreign label on it, even though it's an equation out of a high school physics textbook. Um, General Raymond recognizes if nobody can talk about space, they don't know what you can do with space. They don't know how to think about space. Allies especially find it difficult to interoperate with us in space. So, you know, bureaucratically, one, one of the initiatives that I know Space Force leadership is pushing is to try and be more visible uh, and less classified. Um, you know, and uh, I won't go into, you know, I won't go into the whole procurement side, but space has been expensive and slow. And Space Force it, and the or other reorganization did, is trying to help us do better at being able to acquire space capabilities more affordably and especially more responsively, faster, so that we don't we aren't years behind the competition. And I think it's a little early to say to to know if that's going to work, but that's certainly one of the intents is that you know, a variety of bureaucratic reforms to to make the acquisition go better. Um, to uh, broaden back out kind of where we came in talking about, you know, actions uh, outside the military, uh, I'll just quickly highlight, we are hoping to go back to the moon. Um, the photo that you see on the left, the thing that looks a little like a space shuttle external tank and space shuttle boosters, actually, it looks like that because that's more or less what it is. NASA has actually put together uh, the first rocket that they're going to test for the new moon program. Uh, hopefully, we'll be launching it early next year. Uh, SpaceX will be providing a uh, giant lunar lander. And where this is relevant for national security is where Apollo was all about impressing countries around the world. The new program is all about allies joining us. It's been very deliberately designed to be a tremendously international program. Um, Japan via Toyota will supply the rover. Uh, Canada will have astronauts included. Uh, we have uh, something like 20 partners at this point, several of whom we've promised seats to go to the moon. So we're really trying to bring our, you know, make our allies feel part of this uh, as part of uh, using our diplomatic power. And finally, there's been a big explosion in the commercial space sector. Uh, here you see just in the last two months uh, on the uh, left, William Shatner, Captain Kirk, is now officially an astronaut after traveling more than 100 kilometers above the surface of the Earth. Or SpaceX, uh, SpaceX capsule carried four non-professional astronauts on a privately funded mission, uh, part of a fundraiser for St. Jude's Hospital. And we're likely to see more of this. Now, what does this mean for the military? Probably not much. I mean, there are people who say maybe Space Force needs to be like the Coast Guard and have rescue astronauts and, you know, like, you know, orbital rescue cutters for search and rescue of space tourists. I think we're quite a ways away from there being enough space tourism to make that worth it. But what this, the space tour il tourism illustrates are a couple of, of big trends. And you know, I won't say too much about these. Um, but that companies like SpaceX have made getting to space much cheaper and much faster 
That helps the military because we can put up our satellites, you know, quickly and more inexpensively, but it's really opened up space to a whole bunch of new uses, uh, including mega constellations, uh, where if you add up all the plans for various companies to bring you Wi-Fi from space, there might be 100,000 satellites orbiting the Earth in a decade versus about 2,000 today. By the way, if you like stargazing, I would go out and get your fill of that now Because in about 10 years, all you're going to see are satellites moving overhead all the time. So, you know, if you if you want, you know, if you've got kids, you want them to see what the constellations are like, do it soon. Um, But there's going to be an explosion of how many satellites are in orbit. And sometimes that, you know, one of the applications that is has a lot of military relevance is we're all being watched by commercial satellites that sell data to the public. You know, spy satellites were those ultra-secret crown jewels. Today, this is an image of uh, Russian uh, Su-57 stealth fighters from a commercial radar satellite. Not just one satellite. The company actually has a big network. If you want to re-image a country's military bases, you know, with, uh, you know, uh, uh, site aperture radar every few hours, you can do that or you will be able to soon. And there are players, not just on the U.S. side, but from all over the world. So as these capabilities are growing, we're also facing a situation where, you know, country, you know, companies that the U.S. regulators can't touch, you know, will be growing this capability. Or, you know, as companies think about putting up these hundreds of thousands of satellites, um, who's in charge of traffic management? Who's in charge of making sure that we don't have collisions? Again, very unclear. So the, the, the world is becoming bigger and more complicated that way, in addition to the specific military national security challenges I identified. Well, let me stop there. I will leave you with this hopeful view of Earth from the planet Saturn that a NASA probe took. Uh, I would be happy to take questions uh, in person or via the Q&A, fu- Q&A function in Zoom. Uh, and Commander Ross will uh, make sure that we have a, a good balance and, and field forward questions to me. Uh, so I'd like to open up the floor here to anybody that has, has any questions. Any questions here? All right, we're going to move on to Zoom. Uh, one question, there, there are about three questions that were, that were sent in, and uh, thank you very much for sending those in. Um, can, you, can you talk a little bit about our space defense industry, industrial base, and how it compares to um, the industrial base of the 1960s, uh, but also considering and how that compares to uh, China, Russia, India, and the sure. EU um, today? Sure. Big question. Um... You know, there, there are bright spots and not so bright spots. And actually, one, the, the bright spot actually is a similarity to the 1960s. There are a lot of very new, very innovative companies that often have a you know, very young workforce. From, from everything I gather, if you go visit SpaceX, you know, it is full of you know, 25 to 35-year-old engineers who are all happy working 90-hour weeks because you know, they think they're going to move to Mars in a, you know, in a few years. Um, and you know, I, I actually spoke to a, a uh, professor at Brown who was involved in uh, training astronauts for the Apollo missions, said you know, what he sees at SpaceX reminds him of what he saw in those early Apollo Apollo days. So there are some part, you know, the the rise of these new space companies is great. Um, there are parts of the defense industrial base, as is true in a lot of our industrial base, um, I think seem a little less responsive. And, you know, we've seen Boeing have a number, you know, I, I don't I pick out by name, but, you know, uh, Boeing's uh, craft that competes with SpaceX to take astronauts as or- to orbit have had problems. We've seen a lot of the traditional companies that whose roots go back to the 1960s. Decades later, uh, they're often coming in very late and very over budget. Um, and so part of, you know, part of creating Space Force and the reorganizations around it were to hopefully kind of energize the defense, you know, our space industrial sector. And there are those pockets that I I think are doing really well. Um, There are a lot of big companies that seem very comfortable with, with contracts and, you know, they're, they're kind of slow and things are often late. Um, Russia, 
I would say looks, you know, the, the Russian space industry has been having some real challenges. Um, in fact, the uh, Putin recently uh, strongly chastised the head of their civilian space program for poor performance, things coming in late, slashed their budget. So the, the Russian you know, defense industry, it's not like the 1990s where they collapsed from the Soviet era, um, but they still have some real inefficiencies. And in China, um, it's pretty impressive what how much they have built in a short time because China didn't really play the space race game in the Cold War the way Russia did. They really only got into space in the 1990s and have built out a space industry pretty fast. It's still, however, a lot smaller than the U.S. industry, but you know they too are trying to find a way within their state controlled system to you know facilitate creating these small young innovative companies that'll come up with new technological breakthroughs so you know i if if i had to choose which country's space industry i would want i mean i would take the us industry um you know but but china Ch- china china is doing some impressive stuff great thank you and how how do you feel about the um the national workforce in each of those countries and their interest in in be, participating in their own space uh, industry, huh. uh, kind of like a nuanced question there. Yeah, it, it is. Um, in fact, I'm I'm not sure I've got a great answer for you know, a, a, or at least I don't have an informed answer mm-hmm. for that for Russia and China. I will, however, talk about it. Um, one thing I will say is that all all of the space involved countries. One of the reasons they do their civilian space activities is because they do think that encourages young people to be interested in science and technology, to be interested in space jobs, and that once somebody realizes they're probably not going to be an astronaut or they're not going to be, you know, the lead astrophysicist for the new space telescope, well, you know, hey, maybe being an engineer working on rockets for the military is still pretty close and still pretty cool. Um, not only do Russia and China see that, but a country that's really interesting, the United Arab Emirates. Um, actually, they don't have a, they can't they don't have their own rocket program, but they actually have a probe orbiting Mars. They're planning on a lunar lander. They have and they very self consciously say we want to encourage our youth to learn technology. We think space excites kids a lot, um, and if we build up capability for Mars probes, that's also you know that's very much defense related technological expertise as well. So you know which which doesn't precisely answer the question for the U.S. Yes, um, I do think there. You know what I hear, at least. I mean, I I have taught here at the War College for 17 years. So I don't. I no longer have have a finger on the pulse of today's undergraduate college students. But what I hear is that there's a lot of interest in space careers, more than there was 10 years ago. As we, you know, it looks like you know new stuff. You know, as opposed to okay, the space shuttle launched again. All this new stuff, I think, is is you know uh, attracting interest among American youth. And uh, kind of related, do you feel that um, the U.S. the U.S.'s uh, uh, ratio of private commercial venture to government venture is is at a good place right now for you know that balance? Uh, we've moved away from that since the 1960s, of course, and mm-hmm. you know um, NASA. Yeah, I mean, on in terms of the civilian space program. Um, yeah, I, I think the rise of the commercial space sector has generally been good. I mean, it's it's popular to point at Elon Musk or Jeff Bezos and go, ah, billionaires going for joy rides. And I mean, yeah, that's true. Um, but I mean, most SpaceX rockets are launching stuff for the U.S. military or for NASA or for commercial. You know, it really is a lot cheaper and easier and faster to go to space today than it was 10 years ago. Um, or, you know, out, you know, rockets get all the attention. But if you look at the application side, people building satellites, like that example I just showed of the, uh, you know, the, the company imaging the Russian fighters at, at a Russian base, there's a huge growing industry of space applications like that. So, um, and I think that really is to, to our benefit. I mean, I know there are some in our intelligence community who are uncomfortable with anybody except the Intel community having any, you know, being able to see anything. I think on net, if we're able to really kind of expand, you know, open our minds, I think the U S having such amazing commercial capabilities in space is something we really, you know, should try and exploit. Um, so, I mean, I, I've, you know, I, I've had my, I, I've had my own thoughts about, you know, Elon Musk and Jeff Bezos now and then, but on balance, yeah, I, I think we're better off with, you know, this, this growth of a real commercial sector. 
Great, thank you. And then uh, one specific question about China. Sure. Uh, how, what are the capabilities of China currently and, and how, how prepared are we uh, to countering it? Um, well, what are Chinese capabilities currently is uh, probably, you know, I, I, I will dodge slightly in that that would probably be a long and classified list to, to answer that in a very serious way. Um, but I, I mean, I think that the Chinese have, you know, on, on the civilian side, which I guess maybe a little easier to talk about, I every now and then get asked by the media, oh, well, China just put this rover on the moon or, or rover on Mars or their space station. So isn't China ahead of the U.S. in space? I don't think so. I, I mean, if you compare like all the space probes, we, you know, we have, you know, operating at multiple planets now or the capabilities of our International Space Station, or what's going on with commercial space travel in the U.S. Um, China is now clearly the number two country in the world for space. I would still take U.S. space capabilities in a minute over what China has. On the military side, I am pretty darn sure that if the Chinese could trade you know, U.S. space assets for their space assets, they would do that in a heartbeat. Um, that said... Um, you know, we have gotten very accustomed to an adversary having zero space capability, you know, whether to use on their own, other than buying commercial satellite images, um, or to certainly to challenge us. Um, China, you know, I wouldn't take China for granted. I mean, I, I don't think they're a match at all for our capabilities, but I think they absolutely are in a position to really threaten us. And especially, you know, my analogy of if it's the Chinese Navy trying to take Naval Station San Diego, um, boy, their space capabilities will be stretched. Given the likely geography, though, um, you know, you probably don't have to be 50-50 with the U.S. in order to really cause us some problems. Uh, thank you, uh, Professor Barak. Uh, one last chance for the uh, attendees here in Sperance uh, Auditorium, if they have any questions. All right, if not, we are going to, oh, I'm sorry, there is one question. I'm sorry, uh, can you use your microphone so that the folks on Zoom can uh, listen in? Does this, does this work? Okay. Works. Um, so I just had a kind of an elementary question, sure. um, mostly because I know nothing about this, but uh, you mentioned uh, China building a base in Namibia. I was curious about, uh, and I think maybe Russia and Sweden um, on your slide mm -hmm. previously, could you talk a little bit about the logic of outsourcing space or establishing mm -hmm. these, these satellite locations? Absolutely. Uh, it, it's a matter of just having line of sight communication with satellites. So, you know, uh, what the, I think they would prefer to call them tracking stations rather than bases. But given that the Earth is a sphere, if a satellite is not overhead from China, you need a station somewhere else to be able to point an antenna to talk to the satellite. Um, kind of it's been most visible for China on the civilian side. Like so they, you know, to have satellites to talk to their space station. Actually, the U.S., we rely less on for our civilian space capabilities. We, re we rely less on that because we actually have a network of geosynchronous satellites that NASA uses. Um, China doesn't have that yet. So they're still kind of like our old days, more reliant on ground. The Russians as well. Uh, have several ground stations. I, I'm not sure if they both, I mean, certainly in the old days, we used to even have ships that would, you know, cover some of the gaps. They may do that. Um, but it's a matter just given, uh, you know, given that the earth is round, being able to position antennas where you can communicate with satellites located in any part of the sky. Uh, any other questions? Um, I think there's one for... Uh... Uh, for the soft science major, uh, one more question in uh, Zoom. For the soft science majors, uh, what books or think tank uh, report reports would you recommend um, to to uh, brush up and uh, become more current on space? Oh, that's that's a that's a that's a terrific question. A um, couple of things I would there's a lot of the a lot of work uh, it, the a lot of good work is coming out of think tanks. Um, and one report that I actually two related reports that I would highlight to get a sense of kind of where, you know, uh, on the security side, the Secure World Foundation and the CSIS, the Center for Strategic and International Studies, 
every year, both publish reports on counter space capabilities around the world. And I, I know their authors well, and I'm going to feel terrible that I don't have the titles off the top of my head, but Secure World Foundation, Center for Strategic and International Studies, Counter Space, that'll get you up to speed on what other countries are doing. Another think tank that's got a lot of great reports, including some good primers, like for example, they have one kind of talking about the very basic physics of secure, you know, kind of the why you won't have battle stations, why we care about orbits, the aerospace Corporation. It's one of the federally funded research centers like the RAND Corporation. Less famous than RAND, perhaps. They didn't get mentioned in Dr. Strangelove the way the RAND Corporation did, but uh, Aerospace Corporation is another very strong think tank on this. Um, and I would also reckon to uh, give a shout out to uh, one of our other War College faculty members, uh, Dr. Joan Johnson Fries here at the War College, has been one of the most prolific authors on space security uh, for some time. Uh, I think her most recent book is Arming the Heavens, uh, which is uh, which is a, a very good book on this. Or this is getting a little more a, a little more political sciency, but I think still pretty readable. One of our speakers at the future uh, warfighting symposium, Dr. James Maltz of the Naval Postgraduate School, uh, has a book uh, that I'm going to mess up the title, but space security are kind of the key words, which I think does a really nice job of laying out some of these dilemmas in space and you know, why we ended up relatively restrained during the Cold War and some of the possible challenges that will destabilize things in space. All right. Well, thank you uh, very much, Professor Burbach, for an excellent uh, lecture. Uh, I'm sure that uh, all of the viewers uh, feel the same way, but uh, thank you very much. Thank you.